From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Founded nearly a decade ago by businessman Ken Block, the Rhode Island Moderate Party is once again expected to field a candidate for governor this year. The party has kept its spot on the ballot thanks to the popularity of their memorable candidate in 2014, the late Bob Healy, an iconic political figure in the Ocean State. What are the Moderates' goals in 2018 and how do they respond to the criticism that they're doing nothing more than taking votes from major party candidates? Our guest on the first half of Newsmakers, Moderate Party Chairman Bill Gilbert. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the second half of the program, two political analysts, Joe Fleming and Lisa Pelosi. We have big news. We have a poll coming out next week, so we're going to have a little discussion on that during a political roundtable. But on the program with me now from WPRI.com, reporter Ted Nisi. Moderate Party Chairman Bill Gil Gilbert, thank you for joining us on the program. It's good to have you. Yeah, it's good to be here. Thank you for having me. So uh, you have a campaign account registered to, to run for governor. You have $100,000 in that campaign account. Uh, are you locked in as the moderate party candidate for governor? I am desperately trying to find a candidate that uh, shares the same vision as myself and the vision of the, the party here, in the, the moderate party in Rhode Island. Um, will I be a candidate? There's a, there's a strong possibility I could be a candidate, but I, I think there are people that you know I idolize and I look up to that I think would be a, a better choice. Like who? Uh, you know, I don't want to speak out of school. It's kind of like going to Las Vegas here. Uh, <laughs> politics is a, a, a nasty sport. It's a blood sport, and uh, I, I want to keep those conversations I've had close to the Have basketball. you gotten interest? Um, have you, I do you, have. I you have, have I've had a lot of interest. I've had meetings with uh, prominent people on both sides of the fence, and independents also. So you know we're excited. We're excited with the the movement that's happening here, and I think the the as we broadcast our platform and our principles, I think we're only going to gain in strength. What sort of the timeline, uh, Bill, as you look? Um, because as, as Tim said at the top, one one important thing people remember is the moderate party still has a line on the ballot, like the Republicans, like the Democrats. You won't be <coughs> just off in uh, independent land to right. say that. So, um, what sort of the time frame for you and the other party leaders to decide who that candidate will be to, to coalesce? Well, I, don't, I think we have up until June, until the actual declaration date. You know, we're, we're actually, the moderate party is actually trying to present a viable, credible candidate that has, you know, marketability and that has a centrist position. People are, and myself personally, we're disgusted. There are people out there that are just flat out disgusted with what's happening with Donald Trump. We're also flat out disgusted with what's happening with the Hillary Clintons. People are sick of email campaigns and scandals and we, we hold people to a much higher standard and much lower level positions. And what the two major parties has currently brought us is Hillary and Donald Trump. That's the best they brought us. People are sick of that. But you know, people want to know why people, you know, we have children at D2F that, are, that we're, we're struggling to take care of. You know, I don't want to talk about dead babies, but that's what's happening. We're, we're talking about funding paw socks. We're talking about funding a bunch of millionaires while schools are crumbling. You know, these are not, these are universals. I think there's people in Rhode Island, everybody wants to wake up to a better tomorrow. Three months from now, we all want to wake up and have a better Rhode Island. We all want to leave our, our children a better place, but that's not happening. It's not happening. Anymore. So we get a sort of a, a preview of, of where you might stand on some of the big issues, and we're going to dive into those a little bit more. You talked about Donald Trump. You talked about Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. You're not running for president, nor is anyone from that's the moderate correct. party. How do you feel how Governor Gina Raimondo is doing? I think if uh, we all felt Gino Raimondo was doing an excellent job, we would uh, probably not be fielding the candidate. You know, we think we can do a better job. Uh, again, I think, I put, personally, not speaking for the party, personally, I put her at the same level of what's going on with the Trump and the Hillary campaigns. What's going on in our state where we're having these issues at DCUF and our roads and our bridges are crumbling, but she's in California? I don't understand that. So what letter grade would you give her, A through F? If you were an educator, as a hiring manager, if she was working for me, I'd fire her. Hmm. Pretty strong. Yeah. Um, I think that needs. I, I think we need. To, we need a strong change management. I think that there, we have people that have resumes that don't line up with their job descriptions. We got to stop hiring our friends. If we're going to hire our friends, what I think we need to do is hire our friends that their resume matches the job description. We need to execute. We don't have a money problem. We got nine million dollars. It's not a money problem. This is an execution problem. We need managers. 
We don't have managers. We need managers, we need leaders, and we need vision and inspiration. That's where we need to go. I have one other question for you, technically, about how the candidate will end up. You surprised all of us, the moderates, <coughs> in uh, I think it was September of 20. 10, uh, 2014, when uh, your the candidate you, who was running as the moderate dropped out, citing health, and Bob Healy, as Tim said, went on the ballot, got 21 percent of the vote. The Republicans tried to block you from doing that. Mm -hmm. Could you see that happening again? A change in the moderate candidate as late as September? I would hope not. I, I believe we're out we're out in front this time. We're actually actively recruiting. Uh, we will have a candidate, and it will be a credible candidate, and we're going to be better funded. Uh, Bob Healy and I had that conversation. It was on purpose. Uh, Mr. Spooner did have a health opportunity, uh, you know, uh, an issue, issue yeah. and that presented an opportunity to uh, somebody like myself and people like Bob Healy. Even though we weren't 100% aligned, that's kind of what the moderate party is. Everybody's not all aligned, but I don't know. I, I know progressives that don't believe in a, in, a, in a universal minimum wage. I know Democrats that believe in balanced budgets. I know Republicans that want to help get the homeless people off the street corner, and we have, we have serious mental health issues, and we don't have beds for these people. These are, again, these are universal. If people are sick of the parties. If, if you look at the Democrats, there's three distinct parties. If you look at the Republicans, there's three distinct parties. You've got the far right, you've got the far left. Who's talking about the real issues? Who's talking about the bread and butter, brick and mortar issues of the state of Rhode Island? Why can't we fix our bridges roads with $9 billion? Are there any moderates currently in office in Rhode Island at any level? Uh, there's... There's a town council member over in uh, Barrington. He considers himself a moderate and he's registered moderate. Right now there's 3,000, I believe, 3,000 plus registered moderates. Uh, we're picking up steam. We, we were at 6,000 at our high point. But what happens, I believe, through primaries, people switch parties and they right. don't switch back or they go back to independent. One of the reasons why th third parties don't gain traction is not the throw away your vote. The throw away your vote comes about by how we have plurality elections. We, winner take all. The presidential election is going to be very, very hard to beat because of the Electoral College and the way people vote. We strategically vote. We get it in our mindset that people can't win, so therefore it's a throw away vote. But 2010, Lincoln Chafee, he won. We have people, we have people at the local level that win independent all the time. What do you mean? There's, what physics says that it's a throw away vote that it can't happen? Bob Healy and I ran a campaign with $37 and $39 and a cell phone and got 22% of the vote. A lot of people want to say that was because Bob Healy, could you catch lightning in a bottle twice? The stars are even more aligned. People are even more disgusted with what's going on. And what we plan on doing is running a candidate right up the middle that wants to talk about both. We're not Republican, Democrat. Once, once you get in office, you're for the people. What makes sense? How do you spend money? We only have so much. How do we divide it up? And I think the devil's always in the details. Right now, everybody's screaming so loud, nobody's listening. Well, let me, let me, let's talk a little bit about you, uh, and uh, I want to get into some of the issues mm -hmm. that uh, could be, uh, you know, on voters' minds as we move through this year. I'm going to ask you a couple of rapid-fire questions about where you stand on, on some of the issues here. Do you support or oppose legislation that would ban so-called assault weapons or semiotic rifles like the AR-15 from Rhode Island? You asking me personally, or is uh, the moderate party chairman? What's the difference? There's a significant difference. Uh, this isn't the party of Bill Gilbert. We actually have meetings, and we, we caucus ourselves, and we actually discuss these issues, and then we make a vote on a position. So I'll ask take. you as a potential candidate uh, for governor where you stand on that. Support or oppose that legislation? Not, not having seen the legislation, I can, I can tell you it is tremendously sad that our, our students are uh, being killed with guns. Uh, but at the same time, I recognize the Second Amendment is not about hunting. It's about, it's, it's about being able to protect ourselves from the government. So I, I, don't, I don't know how I balance those two, and I think we need a, a stronger debate. And I'll tell you personally why. We, we've seen over in the last year and a half, we've seen some pretty crazy things from our government. You know, a year and a half ago, we had a guy that got choked out in New York because he was selling loose cigarettes. That's crazy. That's crazy. Well, let me keep going through the issues. Do you support or oppose legislation that would make it uh, legal uh, for, uh, to smoke marijuana for those 20 years of age or older? I, I believe we should regulate it and decriminalize it immediately. Currently, we, we're pretending we're decriminalizing it. We just passed in Richmond. They just 
they just gave the permit for the first pot farm, but we're still giving kids $50 tickets if they actually smoke it. We're using our criminal laws to pad our budgets right now, and it's crazy, along with the, the speeding tickets, the cameras, and our, our marijuana laws. We need to decriminalize it right away. These are, it, when we have these problems like the heroin epidemic and marijuana, these are health issues. We do not lock up diabetics because they quit taking their insulin. We don't, th these are issues that are best dealt with the health professionals and we need to, we need to immediately decrease. Are you pro-choice or pro-life? Personally, geez, I got three grandkids and I don't think the state should be in that issue. Uh, so you, you don't want to answer that one if you're pro-choice or pro-life? Again, I think it's a health issue. My, myself, I've, I had children and I didn't abort them. It sounds like you're against the POSOX plan uh, based on your opening comments there. Are you comfortable then with the POSOX heading to, say, Worcester? Yes. No public funds. No public. should be completely 100% private, private funds. We, when we don't have the funds, again, to, to run our basic services, we can't prop up uh, sports teams that can, A, do it themselves. B, the public-private partnership is a scam. It's, it's not... Uh, a venue that I can rent out, like the Civic Center. If I, if I want a true public-private partnership, I want to be able to use those recreational facilities, and not on a permission basis. Those are the problems with, with that. It's not even a government agency that we elect. It'll be some Paw Sox team say, yeah, you can have a rock concert. No, you can't have a rock concert. And it's just a little tease. I also believe that if I put it out to a public bid, if I put out requests for proposals and said, hey, I got $60 million here, what, what opportunities I got? Mm -hmm. I think $60 million is way better spent at the Providence Zoo. I think the attendance is better, and I think I got a better viable future over there. I have one more question for you in this uh, uh, line. Did you, did you support or oppose the Trump tax plan? I, I haven't even, it, it was too complicated. I, I don't even know what my tax is going to look like this year. <laughs> <laughs> so that one is a, a I, wait I think and see. It it's going like to be a wait and see. How is it going to play out? Their tax plans, well, they're good on paper. What are the law of unintended consequences? I don't, I don't know how that's going to be. The market took a big jump when it happened. If, if you want to say the market is the indicator of economic activity, I don't know if it is. I think jobs are a better uh, indicator of that. You know, there's not everybody participates in the stock market. Mm -hmm. But I think there was a lot of excitement. But I'm, I'm a big advocate of uh, the people are the best stewards of their money. I was looking through your platform. It's uh, is is that out yet for people to read? Uh, you, we asked if in, you could it share. It is in pieces and drabs. We're going to be publishing it probably this weekend. Okay, so um, I, I, there were a couple interesting points in there. One I wanted to ask you about was uh, you mentioned term limits for members of the General Assembly, or the moderate party mentions yes. that in there. What do you guys think the term limit should be for for legislators? We didn't address that when we when we issued that platform because it's still something we're talking about internally as a party. We don't we don't have a position on what those term limits are, but we what we did talk about is the higher level principles. What we're trying to get to is the guiding principle that we would apply to an issue. What we recognize is that humans are fallible. We we all fall to temptation. I know tomorrow I'm going to wake up. I'm going to make a mistake. I'm human, and I know other people are going to make a mistake. And our government's based on humans that are fallible, and they're also subject to temptation. So the longer that, w the longer somebody's in office, the more temptation that gets, the bigger the power, the bigger the temptation. And, and in the spirit of rotation, we talked about in the spirit of rotation, have, allowing new people to bring new ideas and fresh ideas to an organization. So we didn't put that down. We've talked about two terms, three terms, maybe four terms. We, we haven't done that, but we do feel at some point in time you've you, you got to change the oil. You have to have some turnover. You've got to uh, change oil. Moderate Party Chairman Bill Gil Gilbert, it's really good to get to know you. We hadn't met you until you walked into the studio, and we <laughs> hope we get to know you more throughout 2018. Thanks for joining us on the program. When we come back, Lisa Pelosi, Joe Fleming, join us for a political roundtable. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Some familiar faces at the table right now. Lisa Pelosi, she used to be a communications director for former Governor Lincoln Almond. And of course, Joe Fleming, eyewitness news political analyst and pollster, and Ted Nisi from WPRI.com. Before we get to the poll, which we have, it, Ted and I are very excited. It's cross tab season, <laughs> yes. as I tweeted out this morning. <laughs> we have a poll coming out on Monday. We have a great new partnership with uh, Roger Williams University, and we'll preview some of that uh, here today. But let's, let's start. 
sort of where the first half ended. Uh, we had a potential candidate for governor, but on the in the moderate party. Uh, you know, everyone thinks that the last moderate party candidate, the late Bob Healy, helped Governor Gina Raimondo mm -hmm. in 2014. I don't think that's necessarily because Bob Healy agreed with the right. Republican ideals right. uh, similar to Alan Fung, and so he was sort of siphoning off the uh, conservative vote, but just another option in that race. Who, who would Bill Gilbert or a moderate party candidate hurt most, a, a, major, uh, a Democratic gubernatorial candidate or a Republican? Lisa? It's going to be the voter's choice. And if they're not choosing the incumbent, then they have to look at who else is up. And then they have to figure out who is their better aligned with their position. So I think coming from the, what we just heard this morning, we need to know who that candidate is. If it's Mr. Gilbert or if it's someone less or even lesser known than him, I would think that the poll, it would be very, very small either way, that voters just don't know them to vote. So. And it has to be a very credible candidate. Bob Healy was somebody who ran numerous times. He gave the voters an alternative from Gina Raimondo and Alan Fung. I think a lot of people who are union people didn't want to vote for Gina. They also didn't want to vote for a Republican, so he became their choice. But he was a known commodity. The moderates need to come up with somebody who's a known commodity. At I this do point. think if we've learned one thing the last couple of years, though, it's uh, you know, people aren't necessarily following the old patterns in their voting and stuff. No. Nobody thought Donald Trump could be the Republican nominee, let alone the President of the United States, and he is. Uh, people didn't think Bernie Sanders had a chance against the Clinton machine, and he, he did so well, you know, gave her a real run for his money. I, you know, there's so much uncertainty around even who the candidate is, it's hard to say with the moderates. But, you know, things change when it's October and there are mm -hmm. debates and people are getting a close look at the candidates, and they might hear someone who uh, doesn't sound like your traditional candidate, but say, actually, I like that person. Let's try something different. And suddenly you have a, a candidate like that at 10 percent. I'm not predicting it, but it could happen. And boy, we could have a packed ballot. Well, I, I mean, was going to just say that. Remember, J Joe Trill is running as independent, so it's already becoming a larger ballot than it was basically um, four years ago. Yeah, and you have uh, a, a candidate, Luis Daniel Munoz, has come right, out. Right. Again, uh, not someone who's well known in advance, but he, if he does file, and it's another name on the ballot. It's another right. name on the right. ballot. Um, and, you know, and, and each of those people, you know, depending what positions they highlight, can pull from one of the two major parties that start with the largest uh, base of votes. So it, it, it gets interesting. So it's February, uh, or excuse me, it's March now, but yeah, it's, it's uh, March. we just got out of February. And uh, Lisa, you worked, as I said at the top, you worked in the communications office for Governor Lincoln Allman. You didn't work right on the campaign. That's right. But I mean, you had a sense as to what was going on. Um, what, what is happening with the incumbent now, Governor Gina Raimondo, on the campaign side, uh, you know, this early on in the year? What are they doing? Well, she has the incumbency, and that gives her a lot. And I think we saw it this week when she had that press conference earlier on the red flags issue to sign that executive order that really didn't do much of anything. But what did it do? It showed her that she's right in the middle of the gun debate. It gave her publicity. So when you're an incumbent, you're looking for every opportunity to use that incumbency to get out there, to get your name out there, to get out there on positive issues before the voters. So that's what you're doing right now. Uh, as a candidate, you're working to get your policies ready to go, your papers. You're doing a lot of fundraising, but she's obviously <laughs> still doing a lot of fundraising. <laughs> uh, I don't know what her limit is going to, uh, to be. She's uh, over three million yeah, already. Yeah, yeah. She starts. But that's where you are right now in March. You're starting to line that up. Um, you're getting your donors, your policies. You're getting ready. So, Joe, let's talk about yep. the poll that we have coming out on Monday. We're taping this on a Friday for our viewers at home. You have uh, a sample uh, <laughs> sheet. Unfortunately, it's not filled it's out. Not filled and Ted inside. and I are very eager to see when that is going to be filled out. Uh, walk us through the basics here, uh, how you conducted the poll. Okay, the poll was conducted from uh, this past Sunday through Wednesday. We interviewed about 419 registered Rhode Island voters. We interviewed them by basically um, cell phone and landlines. It's important to have cell phones now in the surveys. The sample was drawn from registered voters in the state of Rhode Island. They were screened to see if they were registered voters. And we did demographics by sex, by age, and by political party okay. to make sure we get a fairly close balance to what we have in the state of Rhode Island. And what are we sampling? We're sampling a number of issues. We're sampling the direction of the state. We've done that on, for Channel 12 for many, many years, so we have a history of the direction of the state. I think the last time we did it was in 2014. At that point, over 50 percent, I believe, said the state was moving the wrong direction. So I'll be interested to see if that number's changed much. We're also sampling favorability of candidates. 
uh, basically for governor and also for the president to see how the voters feel about them as a favorable or unfavorable. But at the same time, we're also doing job ratings on some different people in the state of Rhode Island. Because what we find is job ratings and favorability may not be the exact same number. Sometimes you have a candidate who people like, but they don't think they're doing a good job. So we find those two things Or vice up. versa. Or vice versa. <laughs> people, sometimes there are candidates who do a great job, but they don't necessarily like them. Um, the other things we're checking is we have two questions on races for governor. General election questions. Uh, we have a matchup with um, two different Republicans and a number of independents in the matchups. And then we're doing some issue questions on, um, gun, on um, guns. We have issue questions on um, illegal immigrants in the country. And we also have an issue question on sexual harassment. Uh, uh, following the Me Too movement. All right, so uh, Ted, master of the obvious question here for you, because I think I know the answer. <laughs> what are you looking forward to most? Well, look, I mean, you know, you and I, as we know, we worked hard on uh, these poll questions along with the folks at Roger Williams, our new partners. Um, I think first and foremost, you know, it's it, I want to know who's winning the governor's right. race right now, right? Where um, Where is Gina Raimondo right now as she looks ahead to re-election? You know, one thing you got to remember is the governor is very well known, unlike <laughs> potentially many of the other candidates, which means the number of people currently supporting her, uh, that means a lot of the other folks have decided not to or you know they know a lot and aren't supporting her right now so that's kind of a harder right. against than the candidates who aren't as well known I'm also curious how Alan Fung will be doing because he was the Republican nominee in 2014 and has been the mayor he of uh, our third biggest city so he's certainly not the governor uh, who's in the news every day statewide but he is someone who you'd now expect to have some profile so again you might you you'd expect to see his numbers are a little stronger indication of the support he could expect later in the year whereas if people aren't known say uh, Patricia Morgan who's on the Republican side, Joe Trillo as an mm -hmm. independent. While they are public figures, you know, they've never been a major party nominee like Fung and Raimondo. Uh, Fung, as I said, is a mayor, uh, which, which is a prominent position. Um, and so, you know, how many people even know them? How many people have an opinion on them? And then where do they stand right now? And I do think the direction of the state question, as Joe said, I love how much data we have now yeah. on that from over the years, um, both in Joe's polling for us and in polls he's done for Bryant's Hassenfeld Institute, right. um, where the same question is asked right. in, in a similar sample. Um, you've never really seen that return to health in Joe's no. polling uh, in the public polls. You've you've seen it get close to break even, maybe a little mm. positive in the last couple of years, but right. never getting up to like 50% positive. Um, that's a real headwind for Gina Raimondo. Lisa, do you want to make a? I'm not going to make a prediction. I'm genuinely <laughs> curious how the the incumbent governor is going to uh, going to be doing in this poll. But you want to make a prediction here? Well, I you know the number, but I want to know what the number is because she's been hovering at the um, high 30s around. 40. That was what she um, won on four years ago, right. um, what the polls that have ha happened since have shown her. The, so the morning consult polls exactly. we're talking about. So is there any movement? Is she, is she going down? Is she going higher? Mm -hmm. You know. So that's what I'm looking at because right now she has all those years that she's been governor. I think there are people who are disappointed in what she's done. Are they pulling away from her and are, are we going to see that in the poll? Well, I think you've got to keep in mind with this poll. It's a snapshot. It's February's. People's opinions change greatly. Mm -hmm. We did a poll you back many years ago where we had um, Ed Dupree ahead of Bruce Sumner by 50 points in June. The election came down to six tenths of one yeah. percent because of an issue that happened in Cranston. Because Landing. of news, right? And right. that's important. Keep that in mind. Yeah. Also, the governor has th over three million dollars to get her message out. Yeah. So that's important. The Both Republicans, her positive message and how some negatives about the other candidates. Exactly. And no matter who the Republican candidate is, they have to get the money. And hopefully, I would assume they think of the national Republicans will be in to spend money. So there's going to be a lot of money spent in this race to move the issue, move the message. Yeah. Another on the same lines with the polling, I looked back and pulled out. Uh, Joe's poll for us at Channel 12 in, this was January of 2010, Correct. so two election cycles ago. And what did we have? We had Frank Caprio at 30%. He ended up getting 23 at the very right. end. He was the Democratic nominee. John Robitaille, the Republican, was only at 13%. Not oh, well wow. known at all. He ends up with 34%. Yep. And his second place nearly beats Lincoln Chafee. Chafee's at 31%. He ends with 36 So not much growth there. And you had one in four voters undecided. Uh, Ken Block wasn't a candidate yet, but he ended up with 6.5%. And the lesson from that, I think, is, you know, as Joe says, it's a snapshot in time. Right. A lot can change, well, especially it. with lesser known candidates. I mm. mean, think about the major news. There was a lot of news in that cycle. Right. But I remember right before Channel 12 debate yep. was a big moment for Frank yes. Caprio when yep. he told yes. uh, President Obama he can take 
his endorsement in shove. So if you and talk to Caprio people, they were already fading a bit at that point. That might have sure. accelerated it I, in that October. I would think it you, did. You're correct, because that poll that came out showing uh, Robitaille and Caprio basically tied. Two-thirds of that poll, remember, was done before the shove it comment, and Caprio was already going downhill at that point. Now, the so worry I would take if I was Gene Raimondo from a poll like that, and it was it is just one poll, I grant you, but the best proxy for Gene Raimondo in this old poll might be Lincoln Chafee, you know, a former U.S. senator, very well known at this point. He was he was only at 31 percent and he only gets 36. So his support, while it didn't go down, he didn't grow that support much over the course of, you know, how many months of 10 months of campaigning after this poll. And so you, you, you uh, opinions can be hardened right. towards someone who's well known, even if it is very early. But we have less than a minute. Keep in mind, he ran as independent. He mm -hmm. wasn't backed by one of the major parties. All yeah. right. So one quick 30 seconds. We ask uh, job approval for President Trump. If you get a call from Channel 12, Roger Williams, how would you have answered that question, Lisa Pelosi? Uh, if you're looking for a percentage, I would give him 20 percent. In but Rhode he, Island. He's given me a couple of glimmers of hope you know, um, of working on the gun legislation, wanting to do some movement on that, on the DACA dreamer individuals. Mm -hmm. And then he turns around and he does something that really makes me feel very discouraged. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see how the voters feel. We will. Five o'clock. The two of you, 5 o'clock on Monday is when, as Ted says, we're going to be uh, releasing the polls, so make sure you stick with Eyewitness News to get those results. We'll have Lisa Pelosi and Joe Fleming back next week. We're going to dissect it, everything, down to the cross tabs. Uh, for Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. If you missed any of the show, it's online, WPRI.com. Don't forget our po uh, podcast through iTunes. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.